everyone and welcome into First and North. I can already read the tweets that'll be out this weekend. It is the last one without the NFL as many of rookies report to training camp next week, including the Bears on the 16th. Tickets to training camp sold out in about five minutes today. I'm Cassie Carlton joined by our Fox friends from the NFC North, Dan Miller in Detroit, Tim Van Voren in Milwaukee and Ahmad Hicks in Minneapolis. Guys, I do want to start in Chicago because some people starting to panic a little bit because neither Caleb Williams or Roma Dunze have signed their rookie contracts rookie of course report in exactly one week training camp starts in 10 days and no one wants to see a rookie holdout like Roquan Smith in 2018 the money is what is going to be for Caleb Williams about 38 and a half million dollars so they're likely negotiating when he'll get his signing bonus and how much he'll get up front along with some guarantees. Remember, Caleb Williams does not have an agent, but he does have a team of attorneys around him who he trusts to take care of it. He's taking a business approach to his entire career. Not only is he already established because of his NIL earnings in college, he also started an investment firm not too long ago. He said in OTAs he's not handling any of it. So the clock is ticking. We're about 10 days out, so we are going to wait and see. So, Tim, that brings me to you. Jordan Love's extension has to be coming soon. Lily was on here last week joking that it'll likely happen when the RNC is in Milwaukee. Any updates or rumblings on your end? We will not be doing many sports casts during the <laughs> RNC, Cassie, but we will be standing by with that Jordan Love news. It definitely could come down that week. Yeah, I'm of firm belief that the Packers and Jordan Love are going to get this contract extension done before the start of training camp. The Packers are reporting on the 21st of July. Their first practice will be on the 22nd. They have their big shareholders meeting on the 22nd as well. Now, we're talking about optics. We're talking about the way you want to go into a season. Let's just be honest. The Packers and Jordan Love want this thing taken care of as he takes the field, as they can announce it to those shareholders, everybody's going forward. So while the situation bears watching in Chicago for sure, here in Green Bay and in Wisconsin, it just seems to be a matter of when, not a matter of if. How do you cover this? Do you guys break into programming if he does sign? <laughs> um, the latest from the convention in a moment, but first, <laughs> no, uh, I don't know exactly uh, exactly how we will handle it. It won't be a bombshell or anything like that because there's been this uh, you know slow progress toward an ext ext um, extension. So we shall see, but it's definitely kind of on the radar of everybody uh, getting set here at, uh, at Fox 6 in Milwaukee because it is a big week in Milwaukee, but of course Packer news is always big too. So we'll be standing by. Maybe The convention ends on the 18th, so there would be a few days there before the start of camp if the Packers squeezed it in there. All right, I do want to turn to some heavier news. And Ahmad, I want to go to you. Uh, address the terrible news this past week, hearing about the passing of rookie fourth round pick Kyrie Jackson. You actually pointed him out last week as a rookie we're looking forward to seeing in training camp. What do you know about how Jackson and how the team is digesting this awful news? Well, you know, if you know about rookies, they, they're never around the veterans for that long after getting drafted. You have mandatory mini camp where you get about one or two weeks around those guys and then you break for summer camp. And you, I mean, summer break and you don't see them again until training camp. But the impact about the Kyrie Jackson news and when it surfaced on social media, you could just see the impact he had in that locker room and on those teammates in that short, brief time. Makai Blackman, a cornerback on the Vikings team, said on his social media account that he had not cried since he couldn't remember. He said he hadn't shed a tear and he don't know how long. And he said that he could not stop crying. He broke down when he saw the news about Kyrie Jackson. I mean, just heartbreaking, Cassie. You said it last week. I mean, well, I mentioned it last week that he was going to be one of those guys guys that we wanted to focus on this season. I thought he was going to flourish and eventually become a starting cornerback for this team. But now they're just trying to pick up the pieces of um, what he left behind. Uh, head coach Kevin O'Connell said he was just completely heartbroken by the news. And some of the teammates said they'll carry his number 31 with them wherever they go this season. So gut-wrenching news for us here in Minnesota. Um, a bright young loss, uh, life lost way too soon. Yeah, just seeing the outpouring of love and stories that were being shared across social media. I'm sure the Vikings will represent him well this season. I do want to switch gears. NFL.com. Of course, we're in the season of, you know, preseason polls, rankings, all that. An article predicting each NFC team's MVP. So let's go around and predict who do you think will be MVP of your team, starting with Dan and Detroit. You know, it's hard to go against the quarterback, and Jared Goff is certainly somebody that has been a big part of what's happened here in Detroit. He was here when they struggled the first season that he got here, and he's been here to really help them get over the hump, win two playoff games last year, and get to the NFC Championship. 
I think in this sport, that's kind of where you always start because so much is expected of them when you're successful. So much of that credit goes to them when you're not successful. So much of the blame goes to them. So Jared would be the first guy that, that I think of. Uh, look, there's, there's several guys on this team that you can look at as, as possible leaders and, and guys that will be a big part of their success. Um, Jameer Gibbs is somebody that I would look at as a real possible breakout guy. He had a terrific rookie season. I think for all rookies, there's a learning process. He got over that thing pretty quick. He could be a guy that's really incorporated into this offense and takes off this year. Um, certainly, Amon Ross St. Brown, who's already on a record-setting pace, he and Justin Jefferson, kind of what they've done early in their career is just incredible as wide receivers. So, you know, I would look at them as, as guys that have the possibility of being your Lions MVP. But I would also say this. One of the best things that maybe could happen to the Lions would be if their MVP came from their defense. If it's Aiden Hutchinson or Aleem McNeil or somebody that comes from off the pace, because that's the unit that they're hoping can take a big jump this year. Yeah, what if it's someone from that Lions secondary? I know Detroit would be very happy about that. <laughs> you never know. You know what, Cassie? It's, it's been overhauled. I mean, it, this secondary is going to be completely different than it was a year ago. You bring in Carlton Davis from Tampa Bay. Your first two draft picks are both cornerbacks, and I think they're really excited about what they're going to be able to do with this group. And Terry and Arnold has just done everything right since the moment he's walked in the doors of first-round draft pick. Um, they're looking at moving Brian Branch to safety, and they certainly believe in this defense that a safety with good ball skills and the ability to freelance a little bit can come up with some takeaways, and he's already shown that he's adept at that. So uh, whether or not there's an MVP that comes from that secondary, I think there's a lot of eyes on that secondary because it looks much different, it looks much improved, but all that's on paper. Some of that is with young guys. we got to see how they come through and play, but... Uh, they feel like they are worlds better there than they were last year where they got torched late in the season by a number of teams. And quite frankly, we're kind of fortunate to win some of those games with some of the receivers that went off against them. That would be a very scary and complete team if that is the case. Uh, Tim, I want to go to you. Are you going Jordan Love or are you looking elsewhere? <laughs> He's the obvious choice, Cassie, no question about it. We've already talked about him, all the money, that sort of thing. In Green Bay, we have seen two Hall, uh, Hall of Fame and a Hall of Fame to be quarterback precede Jordan Love. And as their careers went along in the green and gold, uh, and I was right there with, with those careers, uh, you saw them separate themselves from the team. It wasn't intentional necessarily, but it definitely occurred with Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. Jordan Love has the personality that he's going to be one of the guys. He's going to be much higher paid than some of his his uh, peers there, but he is definitely that sort of guy. So it'll be interesting to see that play out. I remember asking Josh Myers, the center, who's a pretty good friend of Love's, does he think Jordan Love's going to change when he gets this money? He says he can't. He just doesn't have it in him. That's not his personality. So I think Love is the obvious choice to your question, the obvious answer, because he is the quarterback. He's going to have the new deal. He's going to have all the eyes on him. But like Dan, I would throw a little look at the other side of the ball as well, and I'd say the quarterback on that side, Xavier McKinney. The Packers are not big free agent spenders, but they went after McKinney. They've given him to the keys to the defensive operation. There's a new defensive quarterback coordinator this year in Jeff Halfley. His defensive backfield background is part of the reason that he's in Green Bay. McKinney is going to have every opportunity to lead this defense. He's still a young man, even though he's been in the league for a few years. He played at Alabama in college. He knows what the fishbowl existence is all about. And Xavier McKinney, for me, is going to be the key to that defense, which will then maybe get the ball back more for that offense, which has a lot of weapons led by Jordan Love. All right, Ahmad, who are you going with? I'm guessing it's not going to be a quarterback. No, absolutely <laughs> not. But it's going to be the guy that they're paying like a quarterback, Justin Jefferson, <laughs> a guaranteed $89 million. So he better be the MVP for this team. But I want to go someone that maybe doesn't have a lot of the spotlight, and he's someone that just came over from Tim's area, Aaron Jones. He's the mm. running back for this team. The Vikings lacked a lot of explosiveness in that run game last year. They brought in Cam Akers, who tore his Achilles, you know, uh, later in the season. They had Ty Chandler, who kind of showed flashes towards the end of the year, but he's not an every down 
down back. He lacks in pa the pass protection area. And if you're going to be an NFL running back, you have to be able to protect the quarterback. And I think that's something that Aaron Jones excels at, but he also excels catching the ball out of the backfield. We all know one way to take the pressure off of Sam Darnold in his first year as a Vikings quarterback, get the ball to your playmakers, to the TJ Hawkinsons, the Justin Jeffersons, the Jordan Addisons, and the Aaron Jones. But I also want to steal a page uh, from the book of Tim and Dan, and I want to talk about the defense. One guy who I want to see be the MVP of this team, Jonathan Grenard. He just came over from the Houston Texans. He's a guy that plays both the run and the pass. He can get after the quarterback, but he can also stick his nose in the run game and stop the run game and stop them right in their track. So him and Dallas Turner up on the opposing sides of each other, rushing these quarterbacks. I hope that these uh, quarterbacks in the NFC North and all around the NFL will have nightmares when they play this team because I think those two guys can be scary, especially when you pair a young Dallas Turner with a veteran older Jonathan Grenard. But I think Justin Jefferson has to be the MVP of this team. When you're getting paid like a quarterback, you have to show up. You use the word scary to describe the Vikings pass rush, and I feel like a Brian Flores defense is scary because you never know what's going to come your way against them. Um, this article has DJ Moore as the Bears MVP, and I can see that given that he's coming off his best season in one of the worst passing offenses. But I'm also going to go with the defense, and I'm going to go with someone like Jalen Johnson in the Bears secondary. He is coming off a career high four interception season. He signs that four year, $76 million extension, and a lot of people think, well, will you sign that big? money your play is going to drop off he says he's not done yet and I'm going to believe him he says his motivation is pretty simple he still wants to be known as the best corner in the league oh and he's changing his number to now number one because that's kind of his personality he was the highest graded quarterback cornerback according to PFF last year allowed just 195 passing yards I'm going to bet on him to have another big season and what is a very complete bear secondary and projected to be a top five defense come this entire season we saw what the Bears defense did last year I think they're only going to build on it there's not many competitions available during training camp for this Bears defense because they have so many holes that have already been filled outside of really another pass rusher so I'm going to bet on Jalen Johnson to be the Bears MVP all right one of the most important positions of any team is the offensive line and along the same lines PFF releasing offensive line rankings and Dan it really comes as no surprise that the Lions check in at number one despite losing Jonah Jackson they're going to be protecting a franchise quarterback and Jared Goff um, why do you think that this unit has become so consistent over the last handful of years well they've obviously put a lot of resources into it you have three number one draft picks up there in, in Ragnow and in Decker and in Sewell you have a third round draft pick in Graham Glasgow who left for a little while went to Denver and came back you just signed a free agent you mentioned Jonah Jackson left well they went out and got a guy who went to the Pro Bowl last year and Kevin Zeitler signed him from the Ravens uh, they have tried to build an offensive line for years they tried to do it with Matthew Stafford was here they tried the free agent route they tried the draft route and it just never came together this group has really come together and they are legitimately up there with anybody in the National Football League and there's no surprise that they're ranked number one. Uh, we talked about most viable player. The best player on this football team is probably Panay Sewell, their right tackle. The most viable position, MVP if you will, position group is that offensive line. They make this team go. They're the face of this team. You know, I've said before, they're kind of like the baddest dude in your high school and you walk into a party with them and everybody feels like you're okay because when they walk on the field and that offensive line is leading the way they don't believe anybody can beat them and they believe that they can protect the quarterback they can run the football all things they've tried to do in Detroit for a long time and they're finally doing it and it's that offensive line leading the way so look they've put a lot of assets in it it has paid off it's given Jared Goff time. It's given this team a running game, and it's allowed them to do all the things that Ben Johnson wants to do on offense, and it's got to continue. That is the key to this team. That is what's kind of led this turnaround is seeing that unit come together. And, guys, I think we know if you can run the football in this league and you give your quarterback play action and time to throw off of it, a lot of good things can happen, and that's what's happened here in Detroit behind that unit. Well, it's interesting now because the Bears check in at 11, which is a massive improvement from even where they were two years ago. And I believe Ryan Poles took a page out of Brad Holmes and saying, hey, we need to build from this offensive line for all the same reasons. I think two years ago they probably would have been ranked 
dead last in the NFL, but they've really built it up. It's not complete. They spent a first round pick last year on Darnell Wright, who was good, but needs to be more consistent. And they're still relying on left tackle Braxton Jones. He's a fifth round pick in his third season. He's been really good his first two seasons, but dealt with an injury last year. So they're still determining if he is the long term answer on the left side. And of course, they drafted Karan Amagaji to maybe take over as a starter in a couple years. He's a third round pick. Now, Tevin Jenkins is playing for a contract this year at left guard, and he's been moved just about every position on the line, showing when he's healthy, he's a huge factor to the team's success. And now the question goes to right guard and center. The Bears signed Nate Davis to be right guard last year, but he has not practiced much of any during the offseason or minicamp, which has been a theme for the last year as well. And for how much support they provided Caleb Williams with the receivers they brought in, with investing in the offensive line, they still have questions about who will be snapping the ball to him. They signed Ryan Bates this offseason to be their starting center. But because Nate Davis hasn't been practicing, he's been getting the reps at right guard and Coleman Shelton has been at center. I say this is interesting because obviously everything starts at that position and the Bears have seen so many inconsistencies from the center position for several years. It was part of the demise of Justin Fields because they couldn't get it going consistently with Lucas Patrick last year. So I'm really intrigued to see who takes over as the starting center come training camp. Um, it's one thing that a lot of people are going to be watching. I call it like an unsexy position because it seems like, oh, it's the center. Is their job that hard? But everything is going to stem from that. And if Caleb Williams can't have the consistency from that position, this offense will not be able to fire on all cylinders. Ahmad, um, whether they're protecting Sam Arnold, J.J. McCarthy, you even mentioned it could be someone else. Um, the Vikings ranked 13th. What's your evaluation of the offensive line? I think my evaluation first starts with PFF, and I think we have to look at who's evaluating this talent because I know at one point last year, <laughs> PFF had the Vikings as a top-rated offensive line, and we were like, what games are they watching? Because when we watch Kirk Cousins get hit time and time again, we're like, how can PFF justify these rankings? So I want to start there. Now, lastly with this topic, and I think firstly, most importantly, <laughs> the Vikings really haven't upgraded their offensive line. They paid a lot of money to Brian O'Neill. He's set to make, I believe, $17 million this year at right tackle. Christian Derrissaw, they just picked up his fifth-year option, so he's going to get paid a lot of money over at left tackle. They waited a long time to re-sign guard Dalton Reisner, who was a free agent. He was on a one-year deal last year. They said he's going to compete with Blake Brandle, who was a backup last season, and then Ed Ingram and Garrett Bradbury. I mean, need I say more, like, this is the same offensive line that led to the most quarterback hits and Kirk Cousins being absolutely destroyed mm -hmm. on the Netflix series quarterback and then last season not being able to protect Kirk Cousins and him tearing his Achilles and also not being able to establish a run game for half of the season and pretty much just losing that identity of your offense so the Vikings failed to upgrade their offensive line yet again they just said that they want to bring the same group back hopefully continuity works but Guys, we look at the rosters across the NFC North and across the NFL. These defensive lines are getting younger and more athletic and more faster, and the Vikings did not do that with their offensive line. So pro football focus has them ranked 13th. Good luck. You know, I think it may be worse than 13th this year. But then again, based on how they grade and stuff like that, they may be ranked top 10. So I guess we'll only oh see halfway gosh. through the season. Amad, but I don't think they got that much better. beef right now. Wait, I want to hear I your ranking. I just ranking. don't think they do you that great of a job. might be lower. Of, hey, what do you think they are? <laughs> I don't, I, my thing is if Pro Football Focus had them at 13 last year, they did not improve. I don't see how they play better unless Brian O'Neill and Christian Darisaw both step up their play. They were two of the top 10 tackles, according to PFF, two mm -hmm. years ago. Last year, they both took a step back. So if they can step up their level of play, if this is an okay offensive line, I still think they're going to struggle in the interior aspect from guards to center. So um, PFF may know something more or they may be looking at more film that I'm not looking at, but just from the bird's eye view in the press box, I think we can all agree that this is not one of the top offensive lines in the NFL. That I'm just being honest though. Yeah, I love honest. the honesty that I definitely don't think you want to throw JJ McCarthy back there. Um, Tim, right after the Vikings comes the Packers at 14. Do you like 14 for the Packers? I'll tell you, Cassie, the Packers organizationally, their, their brain trust and their players do a very good job of kind of avoiding the outside noise. They're very insulated, uh, and they, they say they don't even pay attention elsewhere. I'm not sure how they feel about being behind the Vikings after Ahmad's rant right yeah, there. I'm wow. serious. They might be <laughs> taking note of that you. for sure.
Yeah, he was rolling, wasn't he? Uh, I'll tell you, in Green Bay, they really preach versatility. They have, all, I think they have 15 guys going into training camp who believe they will be on an NFL roster this year, offensive linemen, either in Green Bay or somewhere else. That's the type of group they have. Now, will they get the best five out there? How often have we heard the old cliche, we want our best five? That's what they have to determine. They have an opening at right guard. John Runyon left as a free agent. That's probably Sean Ryan's job. He was a third-round pick a few years ago. We'll see. You have the first-round draft choice who is a tackle but could play inside in Jordan Morgan. You have Rasheed Walker at the left tackle spot. So, again, you have a lot of bodies. They've groomed a lot of bodies. Their offensive coordinator, Adam Stenovich, has an offensive line background. They really believe in their ability to coach up these offensive linemen and coach them up to be Guys who could swing from tackle, in, in Zach Tom's case at right tackle, who could even play center. So they think they have the bodies. They just have to sort out who the best five will be and then have that unit play together. So again, 14 there on the ranking, that's probably middle of the pack. Maybe that's where they are at the start of the season. But they think with the uh, Matt LaFleur offensive scheming, the talent that Jordan Love has and the escapability he has behind the line, they will be able to show out pretty well as an offensive line when all said and done. Hey, having more bodies available on the offensive line is going to be key, too, as you get later in the season. All right, Dan, you had mentioned the identity of the Lions being their offensive line, the best unit. Um, I'm going to go around then to Tim. What do you think will be the best unit on the Packers? Packers offense in general, Jordan Love leading it. They have six wide receivers who uh, are definitely contributors. They have a couple of tight ends, maybe even three or four tight ends, if you get, really get into things, who can get down the field. They can stretch the field. they got the, kind of the old-style uh, tight end in Tucker Craft who can bang a little bit after he catches the ball. And, and they have an offensive play caller in Matt LaFleur who can take advantage of all those people. Josh Jacobs is the running back behind there. Uh, Ahmad talked about Aaron Jones leaving. Aaron Jones leaves a big hole in terms of productivity. And just personality. He was really the, the lifeblood of this Packers team for uh, the last season, maybe season and a half or so. So that is something they have to replace. Josh Jacobs ran against a loaded box forever with the Raiders because teams in the NFL did not honor the Raiders quarterbacks. So the Packers' belief is Jacobs is going to get much more opportunity in Green Bay, and he's going to be the man for them. They have to hope so because, again, Aaron Jones is a significant loss. Ahmad, who's your, your best position group, you think? I think it has to be wide receivers. They're making some of the most money on the Vikings roster. Justin Jefferson leading the way. Jordan Addison, a former first-round pick. I think they just have to lead the charge. TJ Hawkinson as well. I'm kind of grouping those skill guys together because they're all making a ton of money, guaranteed money. And I think they have to take a lot of pressure off of Sam Darnold and that offensive line that I just gave a lot of crap to. So I think the wide receiver room, the skill group guys, have to lead the way offensively for the Vikings this year. All right. Um, I heard someone comparing, you know, which one's better, the wide receiver room in Minnesota or in Chicago? Chicago. Do you have a hot take on that right now? No hot take because a lot of those guys, the young guys, haven't stepped on the field in Chicago just yet. So I'll save my trash talk for middle of the season, maybe after that first meeting between the Bears and the Vikings. All right, we love a good tease. I also believe that the best unit will be the wide receivers of the Bears, and I think they'll be competing against the Vikings for that nod. Uh, between D.J. Moore coming off his best season with more than 1,300 yards, you have Keenan Allen having a great year despite not being on a great team, and then, of course, the addition of rookie Roma Dunze, who led FBS in receiving yards last year. I think there's going to be plenty of options for Caleb Williams to throw to and I think that's the most important thing is that Caleb Williams does not have to be Superman. It takes the pressure off of him as a rookie to be that superstar and he can just let his playmakers go to work in Shane Waldron's offense. Of course he has DeAndre Swift to help in the run game too. So I am also going to go with uh, the wide receiver room here in Chicago. Guys, I know it's only a couple more weeks without any football in either of our cities. So it's a really exciting time for the NFL to kind of talk about these uh, little things here and there. And Ahmad, I can't wait to hear what gets you fired up next week as it's going to be the last week before teams hit the field. Then we'll have some real football to talk about. Uh, thanks, guys, for Dan Miller, Tim Van Voren, and Ahmad Hicks. I'm Cassie Carlson. We'll see you next week on First and North.